All right, well, let's move on to our topic of the week. We actually have a... Well, kind of two topics that we're going to combine into one. I, I, sh- I shot you an email earlier this week. I said, this is, this looks like a good topic. And then some stuff big happened in the news yesterday that was could be another topic. And we're going to combine the two right now. For They're the kind next, of related. Yeah, for the next seven or eight minutes. Um, okay, we'll, we'll discuss the first one first. Pretty big news, uh, Pennsylvania related. Uh, Three Mile Island. Um, known for you know being a big nuclear energy producer just outside of Harrisburg, opened in the early 70s, I believe, had an accident in the late 70s. That's what it's well known for. Uh, and since then has just you know chugged along throughout the 80s, 90s, and, and the current century. Closing, likely closing in 2019. Um, several years ahead of their several, license, I think. Yeah, several years ahead of their license. A little unexpected. That news took some people by surprise. Um Kind of mixed reaction from people. I try to gauge people's reaction by watching social media, and you know, some people, yay, let's shut that thing down. Other people are like, no, this is bad. Um, what's your thoughts on it, Dr. Davis? Well, I'll preface this whole statement by saying that I am pro nuclear. Mm-hmm. I do think that nuclear energy should be considered in our energy portfolio moving forward in the future because it has the capacity to produce a lot of energy in a smaller area. Now, when you talk about energy sources in the future, whether that be a controversial one such as nuclear or one that doesn't have as much controversy surrounding it like, say, solar or wind, you're always going to have those trade-offs about pros and cons of energy source. You have that right now with oil and coal and so forth. My thoughts are that if they wish to close the plant, they certainly can, referring to the state. But I do think that this shouldn't cascade into massive shutdown of nuclear energy across, say, the country. Now, I I do want to play a little devil's advocate here just so that people understand where you're coming from. Because I I opened up my own, I think you're a subscriber, news group on Facebook a couple Mm -hmm. couple of months ago, which has taken off pretty well. People like it. And I've mentioned you a couple times. I refer to you as my, you know, colleague scientist. Yes. And they were a little, a couple people were surprised. They're like, "Mm, an environmental scientist who promotes nuclear energy is, that's kind of interesting. Why, why do you? For years past it's often been seen as if you were an environmentalist but pro nuclear you were pretty much a dupe a heretic okay you yeah. were yeah. going with the environmental right creed because right. of what nuclear does pose but the reality of our situation in my opinion is that we are going to be seeing growth in the world up to potentially, say, 9, 10, 11 billion people by middle of the century. And you have places like India and China, which are going to be getting more modernized and requiring more electricity. And you're also going to be seeing that in the United States, too. And the best way to supply that power is through nuclear there was a really fascinating uh, TED Talk a few years ago between uh, Mark Jacobson at Stanford and Stuart Brand, who is a environmentalist who's also pro-nuclear. It's been like three, four, five years now. But I always show it to my students in climatology and have them write a response paper on it. Uh, they get a lot of good ideas being thrown around about each of them. And I believe in that talk... At the beginning, they asked who is for nuclear, who is against nuclear. It's pretty much split right. at that point, 50-50. And then at the end of the debate, the moderator asked, where does everyone stand now? And it slightly went more toward the anti-nuclear side. Okay. But, but, but I see again, you're, yeah. it, you're always going to have these trade-offs with your energy sources. But if, if nuclear – and I, I thank you, Dr. Davis, for educating me on that because I admit that a couple of years ago I was one of those uh, anti-nuclear environmentalists. And then you t- educated me and said if it's done safely and properly, it's probably the uh, – Yes, that, that is yeah. key. You yeah, need to have yeah. the right people in place. Right. You need to have the right oversight. Right. If you don't, then you could be having problems. But – in the United States, we typically don't have massive issues with supervision and knowledgeable people at our power plants. Now, what you do with that waste is 
that's where you have that discussion about right. what you can do with that because it's going to be radioactive for a long time. But if you start looking at other potential sources of energy that could be for more nuclear, say like thorium, for instance, you're not going to be running the risks of, say, meltdowns. One of the commenters on my page was like, well, look at what happened in, in Japan. Um, and I, uh, you know, they, 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 everything was running smooth and then they had an earthquake and, and all hell broke loose. How do you respond to that concern? It, the, with the Daiichi Fukushima plant, it wasn't so much the earthquake that knocked the whole system off. It was the tsunami that came in afterwards. That's a valid point. Which yeah. pretty much destroyed their reactor or their backup generators and their reactors couldn't stay cool at that gotcha. point. And... What that event was was pretty much a more extreme case that you're probably not going to be having every hopefully not year yeah, or so. Right. Uh, take a Diablo Canyon out in California, for instance. That nuclear facility is located on a fault line. Right. And environmentalists have been trying to shut down that nuclear plant, yeah. which I would agree with. That one I would agree with, yeah. You need to properly place these nuclear plants. You can't have them exposed to a potential natural disaster that could give very extreme and dire consequences and if three, something were to go wrong. And Three Mile Island probably is about as safe of a spot that you could put one. I mean, you're not really on a fault line. You're not really near where you could have a and, tsunami. And the other issue, too, is that these nuclear plants are... Aging. They're, That's true, I believe too. the newest one in the United States is from the early 80s. Okay. So you have these older facilities that are pretty much need to be up kept or taken care of, and they're not being so, uh, so, attended to. So correct me if I'm wrong. Basically, what Dr. Davis is saying is while we try to keep improving other clean, uh, clean sources of energy like wind and, and solar... Nuclear is not necessarily a bad thing, but it just has to be done properly and, yes. and updated. Okay, a And I do think with this whole renewable push, we should be focusing on more cleaner, less controversial sources such as wind and solar, which I do think have a high potential for some areas. But we shouldn't dismiss nuclear as just being unsafe at this point. And I think it was also key to look into that article when the Three Mile Island news broke about it shutting down. It's not like they're shutting it down because they're focusing on wind and solar. They they said they're shutting it down because of fossil fuels becoming more popular again. And is that a good thing? That's not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> no, it's not. Because <laughs> right. you want, at this stage of the game, we have to keep the carbon energy sources the fossil fuels within the earth itself. We can't be burning them. We have right. to start weaning ourselves, if not completely cutting ourselves off from fossil fuels, whether that be oil uh, or natural gas even. Right. I would classify that as a, a carbon yeah. because there is carbon. In yeah, no, it is. It, it definitely is. Okay. Well, there you have it, folks. That's our opinion on uh, on the, the whole nuclear thing. Now, let's tie that into... What happened yesterday, or if you're listening to this uh, on a different day, June 1st, uh, with the talk that the U.S. will be pulling out of the Paris climate uh, arrangement. And you and I, I think, unanimously agree that is a very, very bad idea. This is a horrible decision. I do not agree with what the president is doing. I firmly believe that Paris Climate Agreement is, while it's still has its flaws, is the best apparatus device we have right now in combating anthropogenic climate change. And it brings 194 countries now to the table to discuss how we can get on that renewable trend to keep our temperatures below 2 degrees Celsius threshold. Now, all the pledges that are met are being essentially proposed right now they're not anywhere remotely close to hitting that 2 degrees Celsius uh, threshold that they want to keep temperatures below. So we need to really ratchet up. But some of the points he made were just incorrect. Like, for example, costing $3 trillion. Yes, that's right, but what benefits do we get from it? Sure. We're going to be having cleaner air, better health, 
more jobs, especially when there's about 400,000 clean energy jobs right now in wind and solar and 50,000 in coal. And the investors right now in this country see renewables as the future. You have new wind farms and solar farms that are going in across this country. You do not see any new coal mines being Mm -hmm. uh, essentially opened up. And when you have the top two coal companies in the United States declare bankruptcy like they Mm -hmm. did last year, it shows you that the Inertia is already in the system, right. pushing us toward there, whether or not the president is going to go along with it. Mm. And I think that's what we saw with the solidarity amongst uh, governors and mayors of cities and states across this country saying, if the president isn't going to go along with it, we are. I always like to have good rebuttals for people. And one thing that I'm hearing from the more conservative right is, well, it's not that big of a deal. You're painting us as these environmental you know, haters. It's just a symbolic thing. It doesn't really mean anything. Why is it not symbolic? Why do you not agree with that statement? The symbolic in the form of what? Well, they're saying that, that, that the Paris Climate Agreement was just something symbolic, that dropping out of the Paris Climate Agreement is not going to send Earth temperatures skyrocketing directly. It's just like a symbolic thing, and it's not you know not going to, to hurt really. The, the action that you're saying with the drawing out of Paris has multiple consequences. One in That's fact question, that okay. you're not willing to cooperate on a global scale on issues, whether that be environmental or not. Mm -hmm. When we go to the table to try to negotiate in the future, those countries are not going to be willing to see us in the same light as some of the other countries that are currently We're not going to be on a level playing field. Right. And you also have the notion that we don't care about science. Mm -hmm. We don't care about innovative growth. Mm -hmm. It's essentially you denying science and saying we have all this evidence supporting something that's happening on this planet, but you're choosing to not listen to it. And that's sending the wrong signal to the world that you are not interested in what's going on in the world itself and want to put the goals of business ahead of environmental and sustainability concerns. So does the U.S. pulling out of the Paris climate deal make trying to control uh, global warming more difficult? That's a very interesting question, I would say, because one is if you don't have the United States on board, Mm -hmm. you can essentially work yourself around it, but we're essentially going to be the ones holding back the rest of the planet. Gotcha. The other way to look at it is the other countries might feel emboldened, and you might have the uh, public here in the United States where you have the majority of conservatives, the majority of Trump supporters, and the majority of people that do believe that we need to address climate change. Right. And you could have a very large grassroots effort here that simply demands that we do something about climate change and look at doing something without the government's help. Gotcha. I do think the United States, in some fashion, is going to stay involved, but whether or not we're accepted at the international community now is still up in the air. And I would also point out that when we signed the Paris Climate Agreement, we agreed to a three-year deal. So we're in it for a few more years. So we are in it until 2019. Okay. We're not... So that's at least semi-positive. ...bailing out of it. And whether or not we meet our goals is another thing. I don't see that happening now. Right, right. And the other factor, too, is that if you say we're not going to go along with science, these investors who see renewable energies as the future, they're not going to go to America and create the new jobs of the future. They're going to go overseas where they are more accepted, and you're going to have the growth 
occur over there, yeah. not domestically. And therefore, the United States is relinquishing their place right. as a world leader, I think, by removing themselves from this accord. So I try to, you know, as we get near the end here, we're going to have to wrap it up soon, but I try to think on the positive side of things. You and I yesterday were feeling kind of hopeless watching this this, this revelation that we're going to be pulling out. Um, is all hope lost now, or is there still, what, what can we do to encourage our legislators to, uh, one positive thing that I'm seeing, for example, is governors and, and mayors are saying, you know, he can do whatever he wants, but we're still going to follow things in New York and Los Angeles. What kind of stuff can we do to, to help things along? Uh, apply this? pressure okay. to your politicians. And okay. by that, I would mean write letters, call, essentially voice your concerns about the climate and that. You want to ensure a hospitable planet for you, your children's generation, and your children's children's generation. Correct. We, I feel, have a responsibility to make sure our planet is habitable for the next generation. And if we cannot do that, if we cannot look at the children of this nation and of the world with a straight face and say, we did all we could, really what... What do, what, what do else? we have to pass yeah. on to our, our future generations? What what would be our legacy? Right. Yeah. Exactly. There's really nothing to pass on if we don't if we haven't even at least tried. So. Okay. So, all right. Well, sorry to end the the show with such a uh, heavy topic, but we had to do it. I mean, the show and is, we do have businesses across the country yeah. that lobbied Trump to stay in. Yeah. Like big ones, like yeah. Tesla, Google. Um, Microsoft, they were all in it as well, saying, listen, you need to do this. There were a number of Republicans in his own party that said you probably should stay in it, but he just went against them all. So what can we say? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what can we say at this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we can say is we've got to remain active. We've got to keep our, our feet on our, our, our our eyes focused and our feet on the ground and, you know, making sure that we talk to our legislators, phone calls, letters, whatever we can do. Um, fortunately, we have a very good governor of our state, uh, Pennsylvania. He's upset about it. I saw him posting on his social media accounts. The Governor uh, Wolf has been moving forward the clean power plan, even though yeah. the nation is not. Good. Well, that's one positive thing. So, uh, you know, he, I think he's up for re-election next year. So as far as I'm concerned, that's a very important election next year as well, mm-hmm. too. And I also posted on, I think it was my Facebook, actually, right. but uh, the reduction of coal mm-hmm. from 2006 to tw- 2016. And every state has dropped in their coal consumption. Some have dropped by almost 80, 90 percent. Good. There's only one state that went up, and that was Nebraska, okay. about 6%. Scared me for a second. I thought you were going to say Pennsylvania. No, nope, <laughs> not Pennsylvania. I believe we were about 20%, 30% down. That's not bad. Okay, well, that's an improvement. That's good. That's good. All and right. Again, we're just switching to natural gas for most of the electrical <laughs> True. generation. So. Which, eh, not necessarily the greatest news either, but, you know, no, but whatever. But we're weaning ourselves off coal. I slowly, know. yeah. Okay, well, l- leave it to the U.S. But there's still a lot of work to be done. Yeah, it, we're always like, you know, 50 to 100 years behind other countries, but whatever. I think with this move, we're going to be even Couple further s- back. Yeah, <laughs> well, all right. Well, folks, there you have it, folks. Um, you know, what can we say? Uh, try to uh, be active and, uh, you know, follow follow us, and we'll uh, try to uh, you, lead you with uh, some good information at the very least to, yes. to keep you on awesome. the right path. Okay. All right, Dr. Michael Davis, Monsoon Mike. That was a long recording, so I might actually break that up into two segments and have the one where we just discuss the weather and the one where we discuss this stuff. That's, that sounds good. That's probably a good idea because yeah. I don't know if, if we put a 30-minute thing up there. People might, you know, by the time we get done talking about a cut, the cutoff <laughs> low over, new, uh, over yeah. Greenland, people might not listen. Sounds to like a good idea. All right. Dr. Davis, thank you so much. Hopefully, we'll see you again soon. Sounds good. All right.